Quite often I see people seeking for the cheapest digital to analog converter using a given DAC chip. For they think that the DAC chip is the only factor influencing the sound quality. Well, they couldn't be farther from the truth. A digital to analog converter, DAC for short, is a device that converts the bits from the digital audio file into an analog music signal that can be sent to the amplifier. Every digital audio and video reproduction system has one, often integrated like with a TV and a computer. These integrated DACs usually don't sound very good, so more critical listeners buy an outboard DAC to be connected between the TV or computer and their stereo. Many external DACs even offer input switching so both the TV and the computer can be connected while an input selector lets you switch between the two. You can also connect your old CD player or network player to it to improve the sound quality. To what degree the sound improvement will be relevant to you, I can't say. It might be clear that on a cheap stereo in a box system the difference will be much harder to hear than on a 10,000 euro stereo. Your hearing plays a part too, as does the acoustics of your listening room. Even drinking tonic water has influence since quinina has a negative effect on your auditory system, believe it or not. So what defines the sound quality of a DAC? Before I explain that to you, let's first explain that although I will talk about the outboard DAC, the same things apply to that part of a CD player, computer or network player that does the digital to analog conversion. The only exception might be the interfacing between the digital source and the DAC for that might take place using a different technique. Time to start. Every electronics device can be divided into individual functions and this is the easiest way to explain why there are differences between DACs even if they use the same DAC chip. Let's start with the inputs. There are three techniques to physically connect a digital source to a DAC. USB, serial with embedded clock and serial with separate clock. What's that with the clock? Well, anything digital works with the clock. Every operation of a digital device is a stepped process. When recording audio digitally, the amplitude, say the voltage, of the audio signal is measured at a fixed time interval, 44.1 thousand times per second for CD and in playback voltages are rendered accordingly. If the time intervals are kept correct, the signal is fully reconstructed, theoretically that is. If not, so if there is jitter, the reproduced signal is distorted. Please watch my video Network Music Player's Quality Part 2 Jitter if you want to know more on this. Let's start with the currently very popular interface, the USB input. This almost always is a USB B connector which means that USB 2 high speed is used. The 480 megabits per second data rate is more than enough for audio so there is no need for USB 3 while the very high speed 5 to 40 gigabit per second can only be achieved with noisier chips. There are two protocols for audio over USB, called USB Audio Class 1 and USB Audio Class 2. In the past the term profile was used instead of class. Class 1 works up to 96 kHz sampling and is isochronous. This means that the bits are sent by the source at a constant rate and the DAC has no choice than to keep up with the source. This means that it will adapt its clock frequency slightly all the time for it is impossible to be in perfect sync with the source. This slight variance in timing is known under the name jitter and jitter can have disastrous effects on the sound quality. Developments in computer technology and the higher sampling rates that are used for music recording today asked for better standards and that became USB Audio Class 2. Now any sampling rate and number of channels can be sent over USB 2 as long as they are within the bandwidth limit. 
there's enough bandwidth for stereo or 5.1 channel 24 bit 384 kHz audio, so that's no longer a problem. And a second limitation has been solved too, for class 2 uses a synchronous data transport. Now the DAC is in charge of the bit transport from the source. It signals the source to send bits until its buffer is filled when it signals the source to stop sending. In the DAC the buffer is then read from at a pace defined by the DAC's own clock oscillator. Now the quality of the clock in the source is no longer important. The timing is fully defined by the quality of the DAC's clock oscillator and how it is placed on the printed circuit board. And of course the quality of the input circuit, usually a chip, has its influence. The influence of this input circuit is enormous and our hearing appears to be far more critical than was believed until recently. See my review of the SOTM SMS200 Ultra to understand how critical even USB audio class 2 is when you seek the ultimate sound quality. You probably never heard of this interface. That is because it's a general name for a group of interfaces called SPDIF, TOSLINK and AES-EBU. These three interfaces are based on the same technology, the main difference being the physical part. SPDIF uses a single ended 75 ohm cable with RCA connectors and an output level between 0.5 and 0.6 volts peak to peak. TOSLINK uses the optical Toshiba TOSLINK connector and plastic optical cable while AES-EBU uses a balanced 110 ohm cable with 3 pole XLR connectors and an output level between 2 and 7 volts peak to peak. SPDIF and TOSLINK start with exactly the same bit stream. For TOSLINK the signal is converted to light by a simple converter. The conversion and the optical connectors give a less robust signal due to the bandwidth limitations. Therefore many serious manufacturers will only use TOSLINK up to 96 kHz. SPDIF is normally used up to 192 kHz. AES-EBU being a professional format officially has some small differences in the metadata, but when you see AES-EBU interfaces on hi-fi equipment it usually is the same data stream as SPDIF with the electrical properties of AES-EBU. Important is that all three interfaces have isochrone data transport using biphase mark code. I explain this in detail in my video connecting your DAC number 2 how digital can go wrong. Like with USB audio class 1, it is the sending device that defines the speed the bits are delivered to the DAC and the DAC has to try to follow the source. And again with the risk of getting a jittery clock. In early professional digital equipment the audio bits and the clock signal were sent over separate 75 ohms BNC cables. This protocol was and is called SDIF from Serial Digital Interface. A variant is still used for professional DSD recorder sets. An almost similar layout is used inside digital players, for instance between the USB receiver and the DAC chip. It is called Inter-IC Sound abbreviated to I2S and was never intended to be used over cables. Since it also uses separate lines for data stream and the clock, it is, when applied properly, a better interface than the serial interface with integrated clock. There is however no official standard for use over cables. So we see BNC cables, UTP cables and HDMI cables being used by manufacturers and even if the sending and receiving side use HDMI as connector, then still the wiring, again not standardized, might differ. Of course this can be easily solved with someone with knowledge and a soldering iron, but you better find out before you buy. Which interface is the better one? Perhaps in theory the i 2 is interface. In my practice I always have the best result with the best implementations of USB Audio Class 2. But if both the sending device and the receiving device are built to very high standards, SPDIF and AES-EBU can sound equally good, or perhaps better, I haven't done comparison on 20K to 40K costing equipment. 
The connection over internet as used by network bridges can lead to very good results too. Ethernet also uses asynchronous data transport. In almost all cases will the input data be converted internally to I2S since that is the format normally used by chipsets used for DAX. Whatever interface you use, the way it is implemented is of paramount importance, as is the quality of the sending device. This is best illustrated by my review of the SOTM SMS200 Ultra Network Bridge that converts the incoming Ethernet signal to USB while rechecking, reshaping and cleaning the digital signal. When sent to my MyTech Brooklyn DAC, the sound improves drastically up to the level of a DAC of four times the price. The clock inside a DAC is generated by a clock crystal. This is a vibrating piece of material that creates an electrical signal with a precise frequency. They are used in computers, wristwatches, cell phones and DACs. Around 25 billion pieces are produced annually and you will understand they are not all of top quality. Therefore a selection is made after production and the best are sold at the highest bidder. What we seek for high quality DACs are crystals with a precision in the femtosecond range. A femtosecond is a quadrillionth of a second, written out like this. Crystals with lower precision will lead to lower sound quality. The first to be damaged is the stereo image, but also sibilance will deteriorate, deep lows might get hurt and so on. Even if the crystal is of the desired precision, if it's not on a well designed circuit board and not close enough to the DAC chip, performance might still suffer. Most DAC chips nowadays use upsampling to either be able to use milder, better sounding analog reconstruction filters or have the upsampling box ticked on the brochure. That sounds cynical, but that's not without a reason. DAC chips, like all chips, become more affordable when large volumes are produced. Since serious audio equipment is not sold by the bulk, DAC chips are produced for smartphones, tablets, TVs, cheap AV receivers and so on. In that market saving one cent per chip makes a difference, so don't expect a lot of processing power in those DAC chips, while good upsampling requires clearly more processing power. This is where upsampling in a computer can come to the rescue. Even the simplest computer has far more processing power than a DAC chip, so if the program used on the computer does upsampling well, it might pay to have that switched on provided you play audio from your computer of course. All audiophile software players like Audivana, Audacity, Amara, JRiver, Rune and many others offer upsampling so you should compare what works the best. It is possible though that the upsampling in the DAC sounds better. This is because DAC chips manufacturers nowadays offer the option to have the upsampling done outside the DAC chip. The DAC manufacturer then adds a processor with a general or proprietary upsampling al algorithm. Watch my video Network Music Players Quality Part 1 The Filtering. So when DAC manufacturer X uses DAC chip A and manufacturer Y uses the same DAC chip A, the sound quality may differ due to the way the filtering is done, internal in the DAC chip or external by a separate processor. And even if they both use the same processor, the sound quality of the used algorithms may differ. And then there are those manufacturers that don't use off-the-shelf DAC chips but build their own, like Cord, PS Audio and DCS, and they usually provide a very high quality in its class. Another group of DACs are the so-called NOS DACs, the non-oversampling DACs, with their own signature sound, loved by a distinct, by a distinct group of audiophiles. When digital audio was in its infancy, DAC chip manufacturers had a hard time producing DAC chips that offered 16-bit linear behavior on the analog side. 
even Philips did not manage to consequently produce the TDA 1541 chip, their early oversampling DAC chip with 16 bit resolution. A lot has changed since. Nowadays DAC chips have very precise conversions from digital to analog. I've discussed digital filtering earlier, this is only about converting bit values into corresponding voltages. It sounds very interesting when a manufacturer states that the new Model X DAC chip again has a 3 dB lower signal to noise ratio, but I question the relevance for the perceived sound quality. I have no way of proving this and let's not start an endless discussion on the subject, but consider that final at best has a signal to noise ratio of 60 dBs and a very good final playback system can sound impressive, musical and refined. How rele relevant would be a signal to noise of minus 115 dB? Of course the circuitry after the DAC chip is of importance too. Was the designer forced by the CFO to use very cheap op amps or did he use discreetly built circuits? Did he go for the cheap capacitors or did he use audiophile grade ones? And how well are these circuits powered? Which brings us to the next subject. Perhaps the most important part of a DAC is the power supply. All electronics work at low voltage direct current while the grid provides a high voltage alternate current. DACs have a digital part and an analog part. These have different needs. When only a single power supply is used, this can be solved to a certain degree by using a lot of local voltage regulators. In general, if that supply is a switch mode time, digital will be served well while audio will be less perfect. For a linear supply the reverse goes, but I know very good equipment that uses switch mode power supplies and poor equipment that uses linear power supplies. Again, it's more about how well things are done and for what budget. Some products have both a switch mode power supply for the digital part and a linear power supply for the analog side. It is very important that the voltages all over the circuit board are constant, which is done using local voltage regulators. These come in a range of qualities and prices, like all electronic components. Some voltage regulators are slow, others are noisy and the real bad ones are both. But there are also very good ones that cost more. A DAC is in fact a very fast operating digitally controlled volume control. A bit like a digitally controlled beer tap that, of course, is not so fast. Depending on the digital value on the control input, the tap opens to a degree corresponding with the digital value. But regardless of how accurate that mechanism is, if the barrel contains bad beer, the glass will con contain the right volume of bad beer. It's the same with a DAC chip. If it is fed noisy voltage in the input, it will output a noisy signal. What you want is a power supply that is able to supply a large noise free current instantly. And that's not easy to produce with a limited budget. I hope you now see that selecting a DAC on the DAC chip used is far from a guarantee you end up with a well sounding DAC. And there are no measurements that can prove a DAC sounds well. There are measurements that can prove a DAC is seriously bad, but anything above bad can't be proven by measurements. And I've done lots of them over the last 40 years or so. The best way to evaluate still is listening to the device in a well known situation. If you are not in a situation to do auditory evaluation, check out reviews of journalists you like and trust. And also check if the device does what you want and or need. If your digital source only has SPDIF output, a USB DAC is of no use. Listen to reasonable arguments and be careful with hyped products. Check at least other sources. Feel the force young viewer, feel the force. And with this encouragement, 
we're at the end of this episode. There will be a next one next Friday, as always, at 5 pm Central European time. If you don't want to miss that, subscribe to this channel or follow me on the social media so you'll be warned when new videos are out. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Many thanks to all that support the channel financially, it keeps me independent and thus trustworthy. If you also feel like supporting my work, the links are in the comments below this video on YouTube. I'm Hans Beekhuizen, thank you for watching and see you in the next show or on the HPproject.com. And whatever you do, enjoy the music. <laughs>